Good morning. You know, human beings have a burning desire to make sense of their lives, don't we? We want to understand the world around us. We want to have a way of interpreting what we're experiencing in this world. It starts at a really early age. My son, Miles, uh, since he's been about two and a half years old, has been creating meaning around him, right? Giving interpretation of events to make sense of the world. The sun goes down because it's tired, dad, right? The flowers pop up because they like to be looked at. That's one I really liked him saying. Children love to make sense of their lives, but it doesn't stop in childhood. In fact, in a, as we grow into adulthood, we actually begin to enter into the sphere of competing understandings of meaning. And in fact, most of our cultural conflicts today all boil down to competing views of how we foster and create meaning in our lives, right? Marxist ideology says what? It really only has like two categories. It has a category of class conflict and oppression and liberation. That's how it understands meaning. Capitalism, it understands meaning in two categories as well, value, creation, and consumption. Our hedonistic culture creates meaning through the diversity of experiences that we can have. It's interesting. I remember a, a distinct season of my life. It was in my mid-20s. And do you know what everyone wanted to talk about when we were entering into adulthood? All anyone wanted to talk about was their childhood right? Because there's an understanding that how we understand who we are today has its roots in our family of origin, right? We look back to understand the, the angst or the anxieties that we feel based in our families of origin. This past week, I had a really interesting conversation with a guy at the gym. And when he found out that my doctoral work is in church history, all he wanted to talk about was the fall of Rome and whether or not we were on the same path. And all I wanted to talk to him about was the fact that he was squatting over 400 pounds. I didn't want to talk about meeting, but I got sucked into it. Viktor Frankl, a, a Jewish philosopher, neurologist, psychologist, he wrote a famous book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he wrote it while he reflected upon his time where he was in a concentration camp because he was a Jewish man in Austria in the 1930s and 40s. And he pointed out that those that maintained meaning and purpose were able to make it through the profound suffering they faced. And those that didn't succumb to cruel death. Human beings live on meaning. It guides our lives, and we are all in search of a coherent understanding of how the world fits together. As we continue in our series through the book of Romans, we are at Paul's big picture vision of human existence. Romans 8, 18 through 25, in which Paul gives the grand cosmic scope of the human narrative arc the arc of God's story. And what is it? It's about a world that is created good, that goes bad due to sin, is redeemed by Christ Jesus, and yet is awaiting that which is more. It's the story of creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. And as Christians, we recognize that this is the story that can actually make sense of our lives right? This is a story that we can actually, you know, make sense of both the beauty of existence and the suffering of existence, our life of assurance and our life of hope, our life in the present and our life always being pulled to that which is ahead of us. The only way we can actually make sense of life is through this grand narrative that God is writing of creation, of fall, of redemption, and of new creation. And so today, what I want to do, it might feel a bit philosophical today, um, because what I want to do is kind of explain how each of these points, these chapters of the story God is writing, actually help us make sense of our lives. And it's actually a word that we can offer the world that is utterly confused about what life is. 
It doesn't matter if you're working with students in Laos or in Littleton. This is the question everyone is asking. How do I make sense of this world? And how do I make sense of my life? So if you would, turn with me to Romans 8, 18 through 25. For I consider that the suffering of this present time, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Let's begin in the beginning. Paul says the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. What does that tell us? It tells us that we and everything around us is not self-generating. We are not self-causative and we are not self-sustaining. A creation doesn't make itself. A creation doesn't manifest its own existence. A creation has a givenness to it. In the Christian faith, we believe that only God has his being, meaning that which is, the fact that he is, and his essence, what kind of thing he is. Those are identical with God. That he is and what he is are the same thing. He is the perfect reality of life. You don't add more on to God. You can't take any away from God. He is the fullness of what he is. But you and I, our essence, you know, what kind of thing we are in our existence, that we are, those aren't the same thing. There was a time in which you weren't and now you are, right? That means that as a creature, you didn't create yourself. And that also means that as a creature, you aren't responsible for creating yourself, right? This is the great malaise we face today, that we've lost the concept of creaturehood. And now we bear the responsibility of creating ourselves. We bear the responsibility of fostering our own identity. But when we say that there is a creation, we say that there is a creator. And when there is a creator, there is a givenness, a purposefulness given to the creation from its creator. And here's what we're seeing in our world is we're seeing profound confusion as to what the purpose of human existence is. And we are bearing the responsibility to be self-manifesting, self-creating people. And I think, you know, we have a really easy way, you know, as Christians to, to focus in on how that's creating chaos sexually, right? Self-creating people, right? There's a distortion in existence. Male and female no longer exist. Like we're making our own identities. But we are far more blind to the mythology we have bought into that we are responsible for fostering our own identities by what we do or what we create or who we are associated with. We have bought into the broad assessment of the internet age and rampant, and I'm, I should say this, I actually don't think there's a better option than capitalism, but you can't act as if there aren't consequences to it. You are not fundamentally a consumer. You are not fundamentally that which you associate with in your idea of creating your identity. There is a givenness to who you are. And if we don't live into God's created purposes for who we are as his creatures, 
as those that he stamped with meaning and in essence, we will not find peace. We will not find purpose. You can't go search it out by creating it for yourself. And there is a market and a plethora of ideas of how you can make yourself what you are when we recognize that the Christian story says the only way to know who you are is to find out whose you are and the purpose he created you for. Creation says there's a givenness to us. And how we find out who we are is by learning who the creator is and the givenness that he has laid upon our lives. The only way to understand the world is to understand that we are creatures with purpose. But here's also what we know. We know that the good world has gone bad. We know that there is a fall. We know that there is a beautiful reality of creation. God is creative. God doesn't make bad things. And yet the world is corrupted. How do we understand that? Well, in Romans chapter 8, we actually see Paul's reflection on Genesis chapter 3, the fall. When Adam and Eve rebelled against their created purposes, they had a shape, a form to be what? To be God's servants, his priests in the garden. And what did they want to be? They wanted to be self-generating. They wanted to be God themselves. And then what happens? Sin enters the world and the world becomes corrupted. Look at verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Now, this word futility can also be, it can be translated in a lot of different ways. Uh, but the one that I think actually enc en encapsulates all of them is instability. The world has become unstable. There's this wonderful gift God has given you. And because sin has corrupted it, the world has become unstable. It doesn't function as it was meant to function. And this is actually how we can understand the world. Because here's what Christians often think that is not actually biblical. That the world is just completely fallen, right? That's what total depravity means. If you had a glass, right? And, you know, the question is, the idea is that it's just all poison. That's not what total depravity means. It means that there's a drop of poison in it, but because there's any poison in it, whatever's in that glass has now been poisoned. It's not poison all the way down. There's still goodness in creation. And yet it's unstable. It's not functioning as it was meant to function. And so Christians can do something interesting that I think the world desperately needs, but the world can't do. It can simultaneously admit the beauty of creation and the tragedy of creation. We can admit both the reality that this is a gift from God and it is tragically broken. Because guess what? The world is longing for honesty right now. And we can actually be honest. Let me give you some examples of how this can work. Storms in, in Indiana. So I grew up in Indiana. We had a huge cornfield behind us and it just kept going back. You couldn't see a house behind us. You could see tree lines, but that was it. The furthest thing you could see back was some like tower that would blink, right? And in the, this time of year, in the summer, in Indiana, the storms that blow through are some of the most beautiful things you will ever see. You don't want to look at your cell phone when a storm is blowing through. You don't want to turn the TV on. You just want to sit out and watch. But it's also at this time of year that tornadoes come. <laughs> And so this beautiful weather pattern that God created has become unstable. And now it can actually bring forth destruction and death. We can admit there's some beautiful reality and yet the world has gone wrong. Think about the human body. You know, your skin cells, uh, you know, uh, are replaced. I think it's like every seven to 10 days, right? Human cells are incredible. If you think about the body for any time at all, if you talk to a doctor, right, you get this image of the beautiful complexity of God's creation. And yet, we live in a time in which cells multiply without purpose. And it kills you. It's called cancer. 
We can simultaneously admit the beauty of the body and yet the tragedy of the body. We can think about the reality that human beings are created with wills. God created us to be creative, to bear his image as creators in this world by using our cognitive capacity for incredibly beautiful things. But the same mind that can heal is the same mind that can kill. The same mind that can love righteousness is the same mind that can bring forth suffering in our own lives and those around us. The human will is a beautiful example of God's glory in creation that has been corrupted for evil. And then here's the last one that I think can make sense uh, of our lives. The human brain, the closer, you know, AI gets, the more, like you talk to anyone that's actually in that world, the more they'll just admit how far from a human brain we actually are. That's how complex the human brain is. The human brain is wildly complex, glorious aspect of creation. And yet, after the fall, what it feels like is giving the keys to a, of a Ferrari to a three-year-old. And we feel like we can't control it. We feel like it is always sliding out of our control and will lead to our inevitable death. Our brain is the thing that we are the closest to. Our mind is the thing that we are the closest to and yet the furthest from understanding. When we actually reflect upon why we do what we do and why our brain functions the way that it functions, we can simultaneously admit the glory of creation and yet grieve its brokenness. And in order to make sense of our lives, Christians need to have a robust theology of the fall that does not say all of creation is entirely corrupted beyond repair. It's actually not biblical. We see that there is beauty and glory in all of creation, that human beings are all still image bearers. And yet, and yet, we have spiraled into chaos and disorder, and we need rescuing. And I think that word is a word of truth that can actually bring forth healing in our world because the 20th century, 19th and 20th century has shown us that all of our efforts to overcome the limitations of creation, whether it was the utopianism of the early 20th century, all of their attempts to create heaven on earth, all it did was create hell on earth because it lacked a proper understanding of the fall. So first, we could understand ourselves because we are created. There is a form, a shape God has given us. And yet, that shape has been corrupted. And so we need a redeemer. Look back at our text together. Look at verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself was set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It's interesting here. When we compare and contrast the Christian understanding of redemption and the secular understanding of redemption, or even most world religions, what do we see different? Our understanding of redemption is actually rooted in creation. You cannot create yourself. You are utterly dependent. What we also see in our story now, we can't redeem ourselves. We need to be set free. We need someone that is stronger than the one that holds us, that binds us, that captivates us to set us free. It is a story of weak creatures seeking out someone that is strong enough to bring forth freedom in their lives. And this is at the very nature of the word redemption. Because redemption is what? It is either the buying of a slave out of slavery or the buying of someone who's in prison out of prison. The only way to escape the consequence of the fall is if someone sets us free. And the Christian faith says that the only one to set us free is God himself. 
The only one to recreate us is the creator himself. The only one that can set the world right is the very son of God who took the full weight of the curse upon his shoulders to bring you into life. What we see in our text today is interesting because again, we're trying to talk about categories of meaning here. The Christian faith today is lived in a tension of assurance and hope, or what we would call the already and the not yet. And I think this is what every human being needs to live. First, it's grounded in assurance, right? We talk about this like every week, Jesus is for you. Jesus has taken the full weight of your sin off of you. Your guilt has fallen onto him. He died in your place. Your day of judgment happened 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary. But not only do we need a word of assurance, human beings also need a word of hope. We also need a word that there is something yet to be given. I've talked to you about this before. The tensions that we see in all of Paul's writing, there's two main tensions, right? An assurance and a hope. Uh, Here's one. You are resurrected in Christ Jesus. There's an assurance. Huh, okay. I'm resurrected. And I'm going to die. Those don't seem like you can have those compatible. Because there's a greater resurrection coming. There's an assurance matched with a hope. There's an already driving towards a not yet. You've made, been made right with God. What does that mean? You are a saint. God doesn't count your sins against you anymore. You are declared righteous. But I know that in my life, there's still sin. I know in my life, there are things I'm still ashamed of. I'm a saint and yet I'm a sinner. And so there is a pull towards what? A day where you will be completely washed and sin will no longer be in your life. You see, Christians can provide hope for the world by recognizing that there is an already, there is a new life now, and yet we are being pulled into what is to come. The Christian life still has its eyes set upon a horizon. There is still a hope that anchors us. And our Christian life (laughs) is, yes, reflecting upon the victory of Christ Jesus, But that reflecting on the victory of Christ Jesus very often looks like groaning. Look at verses 20 through 2 through 25. How does Paul describe the Christian posture of longing for what is to come? For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The Christian life can understand this already, but not yet. And the Christian life is lived in a longing for what is to come. How many of you have ever summited a mountain and on your way down, you can see the parking lot, the hard part is over, there's no storms, you just have to get there, right? Especially if it's really long, like if it's over 10 miles, right? And you can see it in the distance, but it's like the Colorado distance. It's not like Virginia, right? When I hike in Virginia, I'm like, there's a parking lot 10 minutes later. Colorado parking lot, you see it, and it is a long walk, and your knees are hurting. And what do you do? You groan for it to arrive. The Christian life can live in this tension of being given a profound gift of assurance in Christ Jesus, and yet longing for what is to come, being pulled into what is to come, an eschatological vision of the future. And someday, maybe I'll I'll share with you just how revolutionary that idea is. Because if you actually study classical history, that's not how people ever viewed the world until Judaism and Christianity. So now let's conclude here, because I'm probably going to go over on my time. 
Let's look at the new creation. What awaits us? For I, do, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. It's interesting how Paul describes the new heavens and the new earth. Look at verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, right? Here's what we recognize. Creation, God created it good. And new creation is not a totally distinct thing. It's a recreation of what exists. It's a glorification of what exists. The new heavens and the new earth is not a disembodied life. Rather, it is the redemption and glorification of this world being brought back into its created purposes. And over and over again, what you see in scripture is that somehow or another, and we dare not try to speak more too much to this because I think it can it can really be painful for people in suffering. But again and again, what we see in Paul is that somehow or another, the suffering we face now will increase the glory that we will see later. That the pain you walk through today will only make the pain you are freed from tomorrow all the more glorious. Like a refiner's fire, that brings forth a more radiant gold that passes through extreme heat. So too, this life we face suffering and pain as we look ahead to a day in which it will be completely relieved and somehow, somehow, the great redemption we will face will be all the more glorious because of the trials we've walked through. But not only that, the point that I just want to remind you about the new heavens and new earth because I think there was a time in church history where all we talked about was like new heavens and new earth, never ending worship service, right? And you know, you're like, I don't know, that sounds kind of boring, right? Fair enough. Uh, and then though we swung really far in the past 20 years to what is called neo kyperianism and I won't get into that, which basically just said, no, the new heavens and the new earth is just a new earth. And God's going to have jobs for you to do. And you're going to get to, you know, play golf. And it's basically just like the coolest neighborhood of Denver and Jesus lives at the end of the block. And I think that's really, there's some good to that in that it recaptured the creature, you know, the creationness of the new creation. But what it lost is what every Christian has always longed for that the best part of heaven is that God is there, that you will actually see God, that in seeing God, you will see with the eyes God gives you as the spirit enlivens you to see God. That in everything you do, in the face of the person you first meet, you will see the glory of Jesus Christ shining in and through them everything will be mediated in the direct presence of God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is why it's interesting. Paul, in our passage today, has another already and not yet that we almost never talk about. I don't. Honestly, I just noticed it this week. You've been adopted and you're waiting for your adoption. Look at how he says it. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. 
there's a further adoption awaiting you. And it's interesting, how does Jesus describe the new heavens and the new earth? In John 14, he says this, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. What do we see there? We are finally brought entirely into the home of God. And our status as children of God is built upon the reality that we live in full communion with the Son of God, full communion with the Holy Spirit, and full communion with God as our Father. The closest moment you have ever had in your life to God, the closest you've ever been to saying, I feel the communion of the Trinity right now, will be nothing compared to what awaits you. Brothers and sisters, we have a story to share. We have the only way to make sense of our lives. That we are created and we have a shape and a purpose. That we live in a corrupted world that is good and yet fallen. That our God has chosen to redeem us and our God will bring us into eternal life. This is how we can make this is how we can understand our existence. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the story that you've given us. And we thank you that it culminates in your perfect presence. Lord, would we groan inwardly for that day? Would we long for what is to come, Jesus? Would we long for that day in which you will make all things new? Lord, between now and then, would we have boldness to share this hope with those that we need? To share this hope with those that desperately need it. And Lord, would our hearts be anchored in this hope every day to the glory of your name. Amen.